right. Hello. So se segueing from intermittent Isn't fasting. Isn't she awesome? She's, yeah. I brought her here. <laughs> <laughs> so segueing from intermittent fasting, we're going to go to ketosis. So can you just briefly explain ketosis to, to people uh, and, and also explain the difference between diabetic ketosis and nutritional ketosis? So yeah, so when we talk about low carb diets, I think we need to clarify like a ketogenic type diet is truly a low carb, moderate protein, higher fat diet typically, or it's at least getting the body into a state where it's primarily burning fat as a fuel. And so when fat is burned as a fuel, which the body can flip to doing it. In fact, we all did it during our lives because as, as newborn babies, the, the brain of an infant is hardwired to live off of fat, and which is why breast milk is formulated the way it is. Nature is a little bit smart. Yeah, so, by the way, breast milk is 25% saturated, saturated fat. fat. So maybe we should, if we, saturated fat's bad, we should ban breast milk. Right. <laughs> so ketones are what are produced when the body is burning fat. The cells can, although there's a few cells in the body, like the astrocytes in the brain can actually take fatty acids and convert them to ketones in the brain itself. And the brain actually functions incredibly well, as does the nervous system with extra fats. And so the problem is, is people think of ketones, and I'm a type one diabetic, so everybody freaks out with ketones and thinks of diabetic ketoacidosis. And I can tell you that right now sitting in here, sitting here today, I'm in you know, nutritional ketosis, which means that my body is burning fats rather than carbohydrates, but I'm not in DKA. DKA is where it's a whole sort of metabolic meltdown where the body electrolytes are off, ketones get incredibly high, and as long as there's insulin in the system, insulin will shut down ketone production. So a normal person doesn't have to worry about going into DKA, although there are some rare exceptions where starvation ketoacidosis can happen. Even a type 1 diabetic who's doing it carefully and understanding the principles of it and is not sick and dehydrated and taking exogenous ketones, which is a separate discussion, you know, those are all circumstances where a low carbohydrate diet actually helps a diabetic maintain, whether you're type 1 or type 2, less glucose excursions. Yeah, I mean, ketosis is something we've all evolved with because right. it's a parallel fuel source. We have two fuel sources, sugar, and fat, right. and we burn our own fat. You have you know, 2,500 calories of glycogen in your muscles. You've got like 40,000 calories of fat stored in your body. So it's a good backup system. Uh, and what it does is pretty extraordinary in the body. It, it actually reduces visceral fat. It increases, which is all the organ fat that causes heart disease, diabetes, cancer, or Alzheimer's. It shrinks your organ sizes. It increases stem cell production. It reduces inflammation. It enhances cognitive function. In fact, it grows your hippocampus, which is the memory center in the brain. Uh, it reduces IGF-1, which produces cancer. It increases your bone mineral density. So it has enormous beneficial effects across the spectrum, and it optimizes your mitochondria, which burn much better on fat. In fact, that's the preferred fuel, which is why MCT oil is so great. So, so, this, so you can get into ketosis by fasting. So what they were talking about before, intermittent fasting, that's all about increasing ketosis, and there's hacks to do that without having to either go on a ketogenic diet or fast. For example, using a combination of half and half MCT oil and coconut oil regularly throughout the day actually gives you long and short-term ketosis, which is kind of a sort of a biological hack. A myth, too, I think some people think, oh, if we're going to do keto, I'm going to be super paleo and just have like red meat and butter all day, but you actually live in ketosis. No. And you're plant-based. Yeah, I, at this stage, and I go back and forth, and for me, it's not a religion. And, you know, like I said, the second I feel like my body needs to have some animal protein, I'll consider going back to it. But you can be in ketosis and eat a higher fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate diet. So part of it is can be through calorie restriction, although I don't calorie restrict at this point. But having healthy, you know, plant fats. And the cautious thing with that is when we think of plant fats, sometimes we think of canola oil and corn oil and those. I just think avocados. Of, yeah. I think of avocados. So I carry, it's funny, I have two avocados in my checked luggage and then two avocados that I bring with me on the plane. Good luck with that. And yeah, it, TSA doesn't necessarily like avocados. It usually causes an issue. But I bring a lot of green clothes, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but so, you know, yes, 
being in ketosis can be helpful, but at the same time, there's a number of different ways to do it. And people get into trouble with doing it. So if you're really insulin resistant, you may actually have trouble getting into ketosis. So I use ketogenic diets, just as Mark was saying, that it's really good for the brain. It's also really good for the rest of the nervous system. And ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate, so there's three ketones that are produced, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetone, and acetoacetate. And beta-hydroxybutyrate in itself is an incredibly powerful anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And so we can use, plus it actually is, you know, the fuel that the brain can use. So I use it a lot with my patients. 75% of my patients are obese and 50% of them in a spine practice. So when we talk about, well, like, why is a spine surgeon talking about this stuff? It's because it increases the risk of surgical complications. Oh, by the way, it's much easier to get people better, and I end up doing, my husband wishes I would do more unnecessary spine surgery and stop getting people better without it. But, you know, we can utilize these things in order to help you know, improve outcomes even with traditional medical treatment. Yeah, I mean, I think the key is that a ketogenic diet is not for everybody. Right. Right? It's like it, it does a lot of great things and it increases longevity. I mean, there's a study that came out in the last few weeks how it increases cognitive function and yep. extends lifespan in animal models. But it's therapeutic diet. So if someone comes in and they have autism, if they have Alzheimer's, if they're diabetic that's really uncontrolled and nothing else is working, if they have Parkinson's disease. It's a, it's a powerful mitochondrial therapy is what we're talking about. So th those are indications where I'm aggressively using it, but it's, I don't think it's necessarily necessary for everybody. But okay, if I'm a regular person out there, I want to perform better, feel good, like, can I do it here and there? When is, when is it too much? Like, can I live this way? I mean, it's a tough diet. I mean, it's, you know, 70, 80% fat. Um, which is it's hard like to do. Avocados all day. Yeah, it's avocados, olive oil, coconut oil. Um, it's, it's very low starch, so you know, even nuts are high carbohydrate foods potentially. So it's, it's challenging. Um, but it's, it can be extraordinary for performance. There's a guy I heard about recently who uh, was a Mount Everest guide, and he was totally fit and taking many people up to the summit, could never could do without oxygen. And he was you know, fueling with all the glucose fuels. And he switched to a ketogenic diet and was able to summit without any oxygen. So... I was going to say, again, like any other tool and using it, thinking it as an intervention, there are times where it's appropriate and times where it's not. And other places where people can get into trouble with it, sort of doing it on their own. So I want to move on to stem cells. Can you briefly explain, Mark, for people who've heard our it, stem cells? Not, yeah. <laughs> well, we all have these stem cells, which are sort of undifferentiated cells. They're like the original cells that can become anything. You know, so these cells can become a liver cell, a brain cell, a kidney cell a skin cell, and they're in our bone marrow, they're in our fat cells, they're in umbilical cord blood, uh, and they, there's this huge wave of stem cell research now that's looking at how do we use those in medicine. And it's, it's really very akin to functional medicine because it's actually allowing the body to use its own intelligence to heal and repair. Um, and, and the problem in this country is that the research is really restricted. You can't do, for example, stem cell cultures, which allows you to grow a lot of stem cells from your own stem cells and use them in many different ways. Um, and it, and it, the idea is that it, it actually goes to where the issues are. It's, they're like smart cells, and they go to where the issues are, and they begin to release various growth factors and various compounds in the body that are reparative and regenerative and healing. So who are people who might benefit this. Orthopedic issues are, are really a huge area where it's shown to be a benefit. Autoimmune diseases in area of research, things like Parkinson's, uh, MS, uh, even Alzheimer's. I think there, there's, there's some interesting research going on in all these areas. Alzheimer's keeps on coming up. Is Alzheimer's going to be around in 10 years? Oh boy. I mean, it's, if you look at Alzheimer's, it's, it's probably going to be the biggest driver of healthcare costs. Uh, it's going to affect, you know, 14 million people by the next you know, 20 years and all the caregivers around it, it's just an enormous social and economic burden and it's accelerating dramatically globally. Uh, and it's really driven by, in a large part, you know, our, our diet, sugar, is, is really the biggest driver. They call it now type three diabetes. And so we, we really are seeing this explosion. And the good news is there's guys like Dale Bredesen who's looking at how do we modify the environment of the brain to change the trajectory and actually reverse it. And we've seen this. I mean, I had a guy the other day came off office who was 61 years old. He couldn't construct a sentence. He could barely remember his wife. He couldn't read a clock. Uh, and he'd been getting worse and worse. And he was 61 years old and went to the neurologist at Harvard who said, you know, your time's up. Get your affairs in order. It turned out he had a whole series of issues, including mercury poisoning. He, he had an extremely high sugar diet. He had 
Lyme disease and tick infections that were affecting his brain. And so we sort of addressed all these things. We put him on a ketogenic diet. We put him on a treatment for Lyme and, and tick infections. We got his metals down, fixed his microbiome. And the guy came back eight months later and he's like, can read the clock and he knows his wife and he's conversing. And I mean, I was really shocked. So we, we can see by using this systematic functional medicine approach, which is what Dale's doing, actually begin to see the reversal. Carrie, where do you see stem cells going? So, you know, we as spine surgeons have been using bone marrow aspirin stem cells for about 20 years when we do fusions in people's backs. And so the studies around that, you know, that's, that's fairly stable and it's fairly well accepted. Part of the issue with stem cells is because people think of embryonic stem cells, which are, you know, stem cells from the, the embryo, which are different than adult stem cells. And that's where some of the regulations have sort of been an impediment to some of the research. I think there's a lot of uses for stem cells potentially. I think one of the things, again, not to be the one who sort of brings up, hey, this is all great, but these are the hazards we have to be careful of, is we don't yet know the dosage of the cells that are important for individual conditions, and we don't know how often you have to do it and the durability of it. And so part of what's happening is, yes, I think stem cells, and I do use stem cells with patients, and I think this can be really helpful in certain circumstances. I think when you have an arthritic knee where it's biomechanically unstable because it's end stage knee arthritis, it's hard for me to see injecting stem cells into that to have that change it. And the other big issue is because of the regulation, there are a lot of people who are out sort of doing it in you know, strip malls. And the issue with that ends up being it's direct to consumer marketing some of the, the promises that are made are not necessarily realistic. It's you know, out-of-pocket costs. And again, we still have a lot of questions about how do we effectively use this. And then there's also the downside of any time you stick a needle into somebody, you can have complications related to the procedure itself. So you want to make sure that the person who's doing them is competently trained when they're doing the procedure, independent of how many cells and what type of cells they're delivering. Sure. So I'm going to move on to ozone therapy, which has a controversial past. Uh, can you explain ozone therapy to people and, and sure I mean ozone we know about the ozone layer yep. but it's it's O3 and it's something that's produced uh, when there's electricity from lightning and in the rainstorm you'll smell it uh, it's a very volatile gas that has been used in medicine for a long time uh, it was actually used in in early World War one as a disinfectant the first ozone generator was invented by Nikolai Tesla and it has really extraordinary properties. It's, it's sort of almost been absent from the United States uh, in terms of research and practice, but it's, it's very extensively used in Russia, in Italy, in Spain, in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, in Cuba. There's just tremendous amounts of research on it. And as a medical therapy, it, it's, it's really looked down upon in this country, but it's, it actually has the potential to be a hormetic substance. And hormesis is the idea that you take a toxic substance, you introduce it, and it stimulates a healing response in the body. In small amounts. In small amounts, right. So You have some personal experience. I do, yeah. With stem cells uh, for those of you who don't know, um, you know, I was very, very sick this winter. I almost felt like I almost died. Uh, and I, I had a long story, but I had uh, a moldy barn. I lived in a beautiful 120-year-old barn, which was super moldy, and I was having the effects of that. I had a root canal that went bad. I had a you know, infection, need an antibiotic, and then I got C. diff, and my whole system collapsed. I got colitis, gastritis, pain, lost 25 pounds from my already pretty skinny self. And, um, and I, you know, used functional medicine, but it really, my whole system was in such a state of, uh, you know, catabolic collapse and, and immune and, and dysfunction and inflammation that I couldn't break the cycle. Uh, and I began to read about various therapies in ozone, and I basically did what I call the nuclear option, which is I went and had intravenous ozone twice a day. I did hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I did high-dose IVC and glutathione, and I ended up also doing stem cells. And, you know, within two days of the ozone, I went from being completely cognitively impaired, completely exhausted, uh, and being in 24-7 pain for five months to being almost symptom-free. And, and what it does is it increases... Um, your body's ability to actually fight infections by improving your immune system. It increases all the antioxidant enzymes in your body. And it also seems to kill everything. It's probably the most powerful disinfectant on the planet. So it whether- It decrease cytokines. Yeah, it, yeah. So it, it's initially like, a, but it lasts only a few seconds when you inject it. And then it 
changed into these byproducts that actually have all these secondary benefits. So where do you see the future of these healing modalities? I, I, you know, I think it, it really depends on, you know, how we, how we start to develop the research on this. Because, you know, right now, there's no real serious research. You're doing it on yourself. You're just experimenting. Yeah, I'm just experimenting. And I don't recommend people do this, but I've seen pretty extraordinary results. And I was sort of at the end of my rope. And I think that uh, I, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to begin to do research on this, that we're going to be able to actually advance this field. And I, I think it's a very powerful therapy for people who are stuck. There's, you know, those 20% of patients we get who just don't get better because they're in this state of overwhelming, you know, a metabolic dysfunction and inflammation. And, and this is a therapy that I can be very effective. Wow. Yeah, from my standpoint, you know, I think these are all incredibly exciting possibilities. I think there's this balance as there is with everything in life between moving fast versus trying to go slow to go fast. And so in the academic world, the whole push is, well, let us ask all of the questions. And once we've asked all of the questions that we think we can ask, then we'll say that it's okay for a patient to use. And then there are those who are out who are doing it that are just say, all right, I've been doing this, I've had really good results, I'm gonna you know, build that practice and continue to use it sort of you know, on the cowboy state. Right. And so there's this healthy balance of, we need to push more research in all of these things. I mean, even you know, when I talk about it's stem cells- It's a funding cells, issue though, right? So like, there's no, it's, it's free, ozone's free. Basically, you get the machine, it's free. Nobody's making money on it, and so there's no big funding on it. You know. So stem cells, there are people making money on, and that's part of one of the issues is some, a lot of the studies are funded by people who are profiting from it. And, you know, when I talk about this at national spine meetings, I have this slide that I put up of a whole bunch of people with their head in the sand. And the problem is, is we do that in healthcare as traditional medical providers, we put our head in the sand and say, that stuff's all bullshit. If you do it, I'm not interested in even hearing about it. And the reality is people are doing it. So we need to hold our feet to the fire as healthcare providers to learn as much as we can to be our patient's advocates and to also make sure that everything's safe. Amen to that. We're gonna... Good job. You too. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.